good Father's Day for the fathers. And uh, what about the mothers and their fathers? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Last class we concluded, but I would like to further discuss that topic. There's a statement in the Talmud that every teaching of Torah, every interpretation, every insight, a novel insight that a worthy, stu worthy student introduces was given at Mount Sinai. That means that in the few minutes that God declared the Ten Statements, I, I guess it doesn't take more than a few minutes to read it. It takes the reader of the Torah about uh, a minute and a half to read it. God could probably read just as fast as uh, we can, maybe a little faster even, but he might have wanted to do it a little more slowly. In those few minutes, God revealed all of knowledge of Torah that will ever be introduced to the end of time. And I use the analogy, although admittedly it's a very imperfect analogy, but the analogy only works to help us understand the concept. You write a book, you're a good writer, you write a poem, you draw a beautiful piece of art, for years, decades, centuries, and millennia, people will be looking at that piece of art, at that piece of poetry, at that prose, and read into it and see new ideas that no one else noticed before. <clears throat> now, admittedly, the author, Shakespeare, for example, I used that example last week, Shakespeare, for example, if he would come back to us and read all the thousands of books that were written about Shakespeare, he would say, I don't recognize any of this, or most of it. But nevertheless, it's accepted in the world of art that art is in the eyes of the beholder. It's no longer Shakespeare's right to tell us what his words mean. That's how it's understood in the world of art, in the world of music. You have Beethoven compose something, and then you have people who interpret his work perhaps very differently from the way Beethoven himself would have interpreted his own work. After all, Beethoven was human, was mortal, was finite, was limited. So even if he had much more insight in what he did than, than what we could see, it was limited. But God is not limited. So when God gave us those 10 statements, in those 10 statements, he inserted all of the infinite knowledge of Torah, of all the ideas that will ever be introduced. And when a worthy scholar, and I explained last week what it means to be a worthy scholar, a worthy student, a scholar, has to be someone who, number one, believes in the system, subscribes to it, someone who follows its directives, someone who's observant, and someone who has a, a clear mind, not someone who's coming to it with a distorted way of thinking. But all of those teachings that are introduced, novel teachings, introduced by a worthy student was given at Mount Sinai. So in one sense, it's new, because it was never known before. In the other sense, it's not new. If it's totally new and wasn't given at Sinai, then it's not Judaism. So how do we know if someone's ideas are merit accepting it as part of Torah that was given at Sinai? Again, we can only know that by knowing who the worthy student is and judging the teaching on the basis of, is it consistent with the other teachings of Torah? If someone, for example, will say, it says in the Ten Commandments, do not commit murder. And someone says, you know what, I have a new interpretation. The Torah is really trying to tell us we should commit murder. But why does it say we shouldn't? Well, the Torah is talking in hints. That's a novel interpretation. I just made it up. It's obviously ridiculous because it goes against what we know to be true. So, so when someone comes along and says, 
that, you know, the Shabbat is a day of rest, but the Torah didn't mean necessarily that we shouldn't light a fire. It meant something else. That is an illegitimate innovation. So there are groups of Jews throughout history who introduced new ideas that were contrary to accepted Jewish norms because they felt the need to conform to the so-called modern trends of a society. Those are obviously rejected. But anything else that fits into the mold, even though it's novel, was given at Mount Sinai. And when the time comes, King Solomon writes in the book of Ecclesiastes, everything God does in its time, in its season. There's a season for everything. What does that mean? It means a lot of things, but one of the things that it means is that certain ideas of Torah could have been hidden from society, from humanity, for years, centuries, millennia. And then one day, a worthy student comes along and looks at the same passage of the Torah and comes up with a new idea that was never mentioned before. And again, it fits all the criteria that I mentioned before. That was the time that God wanted it to be revealed. It could have been revealed before, but no, God says this is not the right time for it. I'll tell you a little story that illustrates this point. The greatest Talmudic sage of his time was a man by the name of Rabbi Yosef Karo. There were descendants of his actually in Buffalo with the name Karo. He lived, he escaped Spain during the Inquisition, 1492. He settled in Sfat, the northern city in Israel, which was known, a city known for its great sages. And he wrote, among other works, the Shulchan Aruch, the Code of Jewish Law. He was, amongst Sephardic Jews, the final word on Jewish law to this day. And everyone recognizes him, Sephardic Ashkenazic, as one of the greatest sages of who knows how many centuries. And he was also a great Kabbalist. He became, it's interesting, he was in his 70s, I think, when the Ari, the greatest Kabbalist, came to town who was a kid of 36 years old. I consider that a kid. <laughs> so all you youngsters here <laughs> shouldn't be offended. Uh, so uh, he comes to town, this young whippersnapper of a Kabbalist, and who becomes his disciple? Rabbi Yosef Karo, who was himself the greatest scholar in the world and also one of the greatest Kabbalists expert in the mystical teaching of Judaism, and he became a disciple of the Ari, who's 36 years old. But this Rabbi Yosef Karo wrote many books. He was, the, again, the greatest expert on Jewish law, but he also wrote a very fascinating book which contains the dialogue that he had with an angel. Now, if I would tell you, I know someone here in this room who was writing a, a book about his dialogue or her dialogue with an angel would say, when is he visiting his psychiatrist? He would say that that means there's something wrong with that person. But Rabbi Yosef Karo was very normal. In fact, he was the most normal person around. So this was a real thing. He had communication with an angel to whom he would ask questions and the angel would respond. And there's a whole book with a lot of commentary on the Torah. So this is something that's quoted in that book. Rabbi Yosef Karo was once studying Talmud by himself, and he came to a passage in the Talmud that was very difficult. He had a lot of questions as to what it meant and how it to be reconciled with other teachings, and he was breaking his head for days on end until after who knows how many dozens, if not hundreds of hours, he finally discovered the meaning of that passage that no one else before him had ever, had ever said. So he felt good that he finally discovered the truth. He goes to the synagogue, and he sees there was a young man who was not a great scholar, an average person, average Talmudic student, who happened to be studying that very passage in the Talmud. And Rabbi Yosef Kara was like, 
What is he, what is he, how, how is he going to go through that passage? Is he going to recognize the difficulty? And sure enough, this young student goes through that passage and then stops for a second and says, you know, this is a little difficult. There's some problem over here. And he thinks for a few minutes and he comes up with the answer. And it was the right answer. And Rabbi Yosef Karo felt terrible. Why did he feel terrible? It wasn't his ego that was bruised, but he felt this was a divine punishment. Here is an average scholar, maybe not even a scholar, just an average student who was studying Talmud, comes up with the right answer in a few minutes, and I struggled with it for dozens of hours. And I'm the, I'm, you know, he knew his own brilliance. I mean, he does, he, you don't delude yourself into thinking you're a, you're a you're an idiot if you're a great, great genius. He was a genius. He says, and I had to spend so much time. That must be, he concluded, that God was punishing me because I am <coughs> lax in my observance, although he was one of the most saintly people around, but that's how humble people think, that maybe I did something wrong and God punished me that I have to struggle to find out the truth, to discover the true meaning. And he presented his... <coughs> case to the angel, asking the angel, is it true that God is punishing me, and what is it that I have to do to atone for my sins? And the angel comforted him and says, don't worry about it. If you hadn't struggled those dozens, if not hundreds of hours, to find the meaning, no other human being would have been able to do it. Because it was not yet time for that knowledge to be introduced into the consciousness of the world. You brought it in. The time came, and you had to drag it down from its spiritual perch into the consciousness of this world. Once you did that, anyone could think of the answer. Anyone with, with, the, you know, with just average intellectual powers can bring that into his own understanding, his own mind. <clears throat> yes? Is this book written in English? Has it ever been translated, you mean? He didn't write it in English. Right. <laughs> angels don't know English. It says in the Talmud that the angels only speak Hebrew. They don't understand any other language. So the angels certainly didn't write it. Did Rabbi Yosef Kara write it in English? I don't think he knew English either. No, I haven't seen a translation of it. I'll, I'll look into it to see if there is one. It would be fascinating to read, of course. But this is a, an exchange between this great rabbi, the greatest of his time, with this angel. But, but why am I telling this story? Because this explains the idea, this illustrates the idea that knowledge of Torah that was revealed at Sinai, it was not revealed in a way that people were able to see it. It's like a, it's like a piece of art that as soon as the piece of art is done, you don't see everything that there is in that piece of art, even that which the artist had in mind. It takes time. and. Same thing with Torah. There's a certain time when an idea becomes revealed. And Rabbi Yosef Karo happened to be the person who introduced that idea into the world. And once he did that, others can think of it and understand it without as much effort as he had to invest in order to discover that teaching, that novel teaching. Yes? So what was what, how is What did Abraham receive? if he was the first Jew, and then all that time in between. It's a problem. Just, what exactly did Abraham receive? The question is asked. We know that the patriarchs knew Torah. Does that mean they knew the totality of Torah? No, not necessarily. But they had some basics, basic knowledge of Torah, and they observed the commandments before it was given. And they, they, they certainly had... So was it an innate thing? Or? Yes, it was an innate thing. They didn't have a text. The, uh, they, they were prophets, and the, the God revealed the teachings of the Torah to them. But now, we can understand another phenomenon. I think there's an English word for it. I'll soon tell you what the phenomenon is, and you'll tell me if the, I have the right word. Very often, we find, I see this very often, a, a great scholar who lived, let's say, 800 years ago, raises a question. No one else before him raised that question. And this scholar was from Spain. You find that at the same time, 
in France or in Iraq or in Israel or in North Africa or all the places, the scholars in all those places ask the same question that was never asked before, and they give the same answer. Now, you could say they probably communicated through with email, with uh, WhatsApp, but I have to tell you, WhatsApp wasn't around 800 years ago. So they didn't communicate with each other to compare notes, but everyone comes up with the same question and often with the same answer, living at the same time in totally different places in the world. How does that happen? I think the English word for that is synchronicity. So how does that happen? And the answer is, there's a time when God says, now these teachings are ready to be revealed. They're ready to be accessed by people in this world, but it takes someone who has intellectual powers to do that, who has, who has some understanding of, of Talmud and or whatever the text may be. It could be the Torah, the five books of Moses, it could be the prophets, it could be the Talmud, it could be the Kabbalistic works. Whatever it is, the time has come for it to be revealed. So the scholar and many scholars think of the same idea. I see this happening also in the last century. There are a lot of scholars who didn't communicate with each other and they deal with the same question, a question that was asked a few hundred years ago, let's say, and different answers were given. And now they come up with the same question and with a new answer that was never given before. And 10 different great scholars come up with the same answer. And they didn't necessarily communicate with one another. I'm not saying there's no collaboration, but that's not the case in most of these uh, examples of synchronicity. So that means that the process of Torah is that everything was given at Sinai in a concentrated form. Everything is there, but there's a time when every piece of information that was there has to be revealed to the world. And why is it that certain things come out in a certain time? Because the world needs that knowledge. And God says, okay, I'm going to release new knowledge. Why was Kabbalah, Jewish mysticism, a hidden teaching for centuries, and then all of a sudden it becomes popularized? The answer is because that's an area of knowledge that was not something the world was ready for. And the, even the Kabbalists had to hide their teachings. They did not allow people... Uh, Rabbi Shimon Bar Yechai was the Talmudic sage who wrote the Zohar. He was the greatest uh, Kabbalist of his time and of many generations and centuries later as well. He didn't let all, his, all the rabbis come to his classes. The Arizal, the great Kabbalist of the uh, 16th, 15th, 16th century, 16th century, uh, he was to give a, t a lesson of Kabbalah to a select few, and there was another great rabbi in town in Svat, who was known as Rabbi Moshe Alshich, who wrote a beautiful commentary on the Torah, brilliant scholar in his own right, and he would come to the class, and he would fall asleep. And the Arizal was not boring, I can assure you that. And this great scholar would fall asleep. Now it can happen. You had a, you had a, you wouldn't go to, you didn't sleep much the night before. But every time he showed up, as soon as the lesson would begin, he would fall asleep, and he felt very bad. And the Yaris, I told him, don't feel bad. Your soul is not connected to this the domain of mysticism. Your soul is connected to other levels of Torah knowledge. It wasn't for everyone. But then, as generations progressed these teachings were revealed to more and more people and even popularized to a certain extent. Why? Because Torah was given to shape and mold the world, and when something is needed for the world, that's when that knowledge of Torah becomes revealed through the great scholars of each and every generation. Now, when we're dealing with Jewish law, how do we find the answers to new questions that are not discussed explicitly in the Torah or in the Talmud? So there are methods of interpretation. There's an original list that's actually incorporated in our daily liturgy. We say this every morning. Thirteen methods of interpretation. 
That means the Torah could say X, but with a method of deduction, method of interpretation, we know Y and Z and everything else. And I'm going to give you two examples of how this method of deduction is used, two methods of deduction, of two of the 13. <clears throat> Number one is called Kal V'chomer. Kal V'chomer. K-A-L, K-A-H-L, if you want to get the right. Kal V V Chomer, C-H-O-M-E-R. That means, literally, light and heavy, lenient, stringent. What does that mean? So first I'll explain the principle, and then I'll give you the example that's in the, on the outline. If the Torah tells you that in a situation, we'll call that situation A, the law says you can't do something. But it doesn't talk about situation B. The Torah doesn't tell you. Let me give you an illustration from contemporary society that may help you understand. There's a sign that on, the, on the highway that says, don't exceed 80 miles per hour. That's my favorite speed. <laughs> don't exceed 80 miles an hour. But it's only on the highway. When you get off on the ramp, there's no sign that says don't exceed 80 miles an hour. So what does a person say? I can go 80, but I can go 90 on the ramp. And when you stop by the officer, and he tells you you were speeding, he says, but it says over there on the highway not to go 80, more than 80. It doesn't say that on the ramp. And the, the policeman says, Kal v'chomer, if he's a Talmudic scholar. <laughs> if on the highway you can't go more than 80, how much more so than on the ramp you can't go more than 80? That's an example of Kal v'chomer. You're deducing a major from a minor. A mi the, the highway is a minor situation. It's easy to speed on a highway. It's, and yet you have to go, you have to stop at a certain speed limit. How much more so on the ramp that you can't go beyond that even though there's no sign there. You can't use that as a defense. I don't think any lawyer would, would take that case for you. I tried it. <laughs> you tried it? <laughs> it didn't work out. It didn't work. I didn't think it would. So that's, that's the principle behind this. So here's an example in the Talmud. And we're going to talk about the laws of torts, laws of damages. In the olden, the olden days, people had oxen and bulls, and those sometimes would cause problems. And you have to pay for the damages that your animal causes. The same thing would be true if you have a dog, and your dog is a vicious dog, and it bites someone, it destroys property. You would have to pay for the damages. And the, the, the Mishnah lists different kinds of damages. One is called keren. Keren means the horn, the horns. The animal gores another, another animal. And the other animal is, let's say, worth $1,000. You have to pay 500 the first two times because most animals were domesticated and were not likely to be goring animals. So the Torah allows you to pay only 50%. If it happens the third time, then you pay full damages. That's the law of Keren, of the horn, or any other type of damage done with malice. So if the animal kicks another animal, the animal bites another animal, those are all examples of, of Karen. They all go under the rubric of Karen, a, a vicious attack using its horns or its body and so on. And that the Torah says, it's, the Torah describes it as happening in a public domain. So you're leading your, your animal in the public domain, and this other animal comes along and gores your animal. So you have to pay, you have to pay half damage the first two times, then you pay the full damage. The Torah doesn't say what would happen if the ox goes into your into someone else's yard 
Torah only speaks about something happening in the street. What about if it happens in, your, in the private yard? Do you still have to pay damages? So the Talmud says, yes, absolutely. Why? It doesn't say in the Torah. Because there is a law that if the animal eats someone else's produce, in the public domain, you don't have to pay anything. In other words, if, you're, if you leave your produce in the street and a dog comes along and takes advantage of that and has a meal, you don't have to pay for it. The logic is because don't leave your food in the street. It's your carelessness. But if he comes in the private domain, if the dog or the other, any other animal comes into your backyard and there's a barbecue and eats up all the hot dogs, then you have to pay for it. So here's the Talmud's reasoning. If an animal which does damage by eating pays nothing in the public domain, but pays full damages in a private domain, certainly an, an animal that does a vicious, malicious act, who pays at least half damages in the, private, in the public domain, certainly should pay full damages in the private domain. That's called kal v'chomer. We took a lighter situation, the situation of the animal eating someone else's produce, which is more lenient type of, of uh, damage, because you're exempt if you do it in the public domain. And we deduce from that that certainly an, an, an animal does something malicious, where it does, you do pay damages in the public domain, you certainly would have to pay damages in the private domain, even though the Torah doesn't mention it. It doesn't have to mention it. We can de 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 deduce it. In other words, what the first principle of interpretation uses the power of deduction. So the Torah will say one thing, and we use the power of deduction to apply it to other things. Now, I just gave you, simplified it because there are a lot of, there are sometimes, there could be exceptions to that. There could be good reasons why certain things are more lenient, but not necessarily should be considered to be more lenient. They could be extenuating circumstances. But I, I give you the, the general idea. The second principle of interpretation is called Gzeira Shava, an equal, equal terminology. In other words, if the Torah says a law in one area, and it uses an unnecessary word, a word that could have been omitted, and that wouldn't have affected the flow of, of, of meaning in that verse, and we find in another totally different area of, of the Torah, where the Torah uses that same expression, or very similar expression, that was also unnecessary. That's a hint that the Torah is giving you. You should compare the two and apply the laws that apply to A to B. And I'll give you the illustration here. How does one affect a legal marriage in Judaism? If you want to marry someone, what makes the marriage binding? Because what? Glass. What? Break the glass. No, that's a custom. To <laughs> break the glass. There, there are three ways that a marriage becomes legal. In other words, once it's legal, if the wife commits adultery, it's adultery. The obligations of the husband to the wife, the ketubah, the marriage, marital obligations, and all the other things associated with marriage. What? If, if I tell someone, I want to marry you, and you say yes, okay, are we, both, we, are we both married now? Yes, we agree we're married. No, that doesn't do anything. That, does, that doesn't affect a transaction. And the same thing is true with if buying and selling a table or anything. There are certain laws. What constitutes the transfer of ownership from party A to party B? What creates this relationship? So there are three ways it can be done. One way, which is frowned upon, is that a man and a woman have relations, intimacy, without any other introductory procedures. That's frowned upon, that's not modest, that, that, that should be the way they start their relationship. But if they had in mind that this should make them married, they are married. Then you have the contract. 
You write a contract saying that A is marrying B, and it's signed by two witnesses. And the husband gives the contract to the wife. But the third way, which is really the first way, I, I put it in reverse order. The first way is called kesef. What does kesef mean? Money. Literally, it means silver, but it, it means money. You give something of value. The husband gives something of value to the wife, not the other way around. If you want to go into that, we can spend some time on that also, but that's not the main point I'm trying to make. In other words, when a man goes to, over to a woman, and it's only a man and a woman, by the way, and says to the woman, I'm giving you an article of value. It could be anything. It could be a book. It could be a computer. It could be a new car. It could be, it could be a ring. And the custom is to use a ring. That's the custom. But it doesn't have to be a ring. Although no one else, no one does it any other way. The custom became enshrined in Jewish law. Give a refrigerator. Give a refrigerator. <laughs> it's going to be a little bit of a problem how you transfer the refrigerator. But there are ways of doing it. So you give, let's take the ring, the article of value, and the husband gives it to the, the bride and says to her, you are betrothed unto me with this ring in accordance with the laws of Moses and Israel. That's the phrase that we say. And then you're married. And if later on they say, well, I don't want to be married to this guy, it's too late. You need a divorce. You need a get. Yes? In the craziness that exists nowadays where people can have sex change surgery, if a man and another biological man who is now a woman yeah. want to get married and they're Jewish, is, can that be a legal marriage? Okay, you're, you're getting into an area that's very controversial, although in the Jewish law it's not that controversial, but i like to maybe have a lecture on that subject and uh, get a lot of demonstrators outside. <laughs> yes. But I don't want to go into it right now. Uh, okay, so the man gives the woman an article of value. It could be a ring, it could be anything, and does it with the intention of being married. That affects marriage. Where in the Torah does it say that that's the way to get married? If you look in the Torah, the Torah describes marriage but it doesn't say anything about giving, giving a ring or giving money or giving anything of value. It's deduced using the second method of interpretation. When the Torah speaks about marriage, it says the following in Hebrew, Ki, when, yikach, ish, isha. When a man will take a woman and goes on to describe the, the, the relationship. doesn't say how man takes the woman. It's, it's like any other part of the Torah where it's very ambiguous. Don't know what the Torah means. So the Talmud says that when Abraham purchases a burial plot for his wife, the Torah also uses the term, a similar term, he says to the man who owned the burial plot, I'm giving or I gave the money, take it from me. The word take is used, which is, it doesn't have to be written. If I say I gave you the, the money, it's obvious that you took it. <laughs> you don't have to write the word take it from me. I gave it, so it's, it, he gave it. The Torah uses a similar expression, and there it's talking about money, giving money. From this we derive that when the Torah says a man takes a woman in marriage, it means through money, by giving money, or anything that has mon monetary value. Yes? When uh, Jacob's daughter, his na her name was Diana? Dina. 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 When Jacob's daughter, Dina, is taken by whoever... Shem. Shem. And um, uh, he's basically, I assume, raped. Right. And, but he wants to marry her. And he, he agrees, I marry her. From his point of view, he would be married. Were they, would they be considered married? No, absolutely not. You can't marry someone against her will. Why well, I don't know. Was it against Dina's will? She was raped. 
<laughs> well, afterwards, though. Afterwards, it's obvious that she didn't want to be married to this uh, hooligan. No, again, the Torah is vague. It's like Stockholm Right. Syndrome. The Torah doesn't say clearly that she didn't want to remain married to him, but it's uh, it's obvious. I mean, common sense says that she wouldn't want to. You said remain married. Does that mean that I mean, remain to remain with him. I didn't mean in that sense. Okay. That she wouldn't want to be married to him and stay with him. Yes? Did women have rights back then? Let's say they didn't want to marry someone. They weren't intimate with them. No, 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 women no, had, no. you couldn't, you can't marry someone against her will. Okay. But when you do get married, the way to do, to affect the marriage transaction is through giving an article of value, it has a monetary value, and it's based on the second method of interpretation. Yes? This is just tangential, but my understanding about Orthodox marriages, there was a form where you exchanged the ring, no, no exchanges of rings. Only okay. one you ring give is the given. Ring. The give man the gives it to the woman. You give the ring. You sign the ketubah. And then right after the service, it's supposed to be put in a room and to, to actually consummate. No, marriage. no, that's not true. That's not true. They, they're put in a room to be alone for about seven minutes to indicate that they're now permitted to be together alone. And that's, that's the finalization of the marriage. The consummation of it happens in their home. Yeah, I understand. And oh, okay. Usually they have something to eat. Right. They, usually they're fasting the day of the wedding. The, right. the, the, the husband, the, the bride and groom fast. Yeah. So there's some refreshments there. And they get to talk to each other because they haven't seen each other for a week. Before the marriage, the bride and the bridegroom do not see each other. Thank you. <laughs> so, so that's the first time, well, they see at the wedding ceremony, they see each other, but there's no communication until they go into that room. But yet, yeah. What they do in that room is their business. Okay. I mean, the, the doors are locked, and there are two witnesses standing outside to make sure they don't escape, <laughs> or that no one else intrudes and goes into that room and takes away from their privacy. Another tangential question. Suppose part of, it, the, part of the service includes... The woman going around the husband said that's minutes. a custom. Oh, that's Not a everyone custom. does that. That's a custom. Okay, so that's just an illustration of these two principles. And there are other principles. I'll give you one third example. The, the twelfth principle is to understand, interpret something based on context. Everyone knows the Ten Commandments. What are the sixth commandment? Do not commit murder. What's the seventh one? Do not, do not commit adultery. What's the eighth one? Steal. Don't steal. Okay. Does that mean you're not allowed to steal property from someone else? No, that's not what it means. Because murder and adultery are capital crimes. So, under certain circumstances, it's not, it has to be witnesses, they have to be warned, but so theft is not a capital crime. So it must be referring to a capital form of theft. What's a capital form of theft in Jewish law? Kidnapping. Kidnapping. So when the Torah says in the so-called Ten Commandments, don't steal, it refers to kidnapping. Now what about theft? That means theft is acceptable? No, in Leviticus, the Torah says clearly don't steal. And there the context is monetary theft. Of course, by extension, people will say that all forms of theft are contained within that commandment, but the literal meaning of that commandment, based on the context, is kidnapping. Okay, now the question reverses itself. We explained and argued very stridently that there had to be an oral tradition, because if the things would have been written and everything would have been written, it would have been distorted and misinterpreted by every succeeding generation, which is what happened to the people who didn't believe in the Oral Torah. So they began to interpret things the opposite of what they were intended. I gave the example of the Shema. The Shema is the most clear, the most uh, demonstrative teaching about one God, not a composite God. And yet it was taken to mean that there's a trinity. The very opposite of what it was supposed to be. A Jews died because they refused to compromise their belief in absolutely one God. 
But yet that verse was so taken out of context and distorted because it was a text. If no one ever had that text, it couldn't have been distorted. We're not going to get rid of the text, God forbid, but you can't just rely on a text. You have to have the interpretation, and that was handed down from one generation to another. In addition, the oral Torah preserves the, not just the integrity of the text, but also the spirit of the text. A text is very dry, it's, it's sterile. Humans are endowed with a soul that could bring out the soul of the text. So you have to have a teacher, you have to have someone who lives the Torah to learn how to practice the Torah and apply the Torah. Otherwise, it's just like reading a text. I don't know if this is true, but in the, in the, in the field of music, could you just become a musician, a great artist, without having any teacher, just by reading books? Could the great musicians here <laughs> answer? I could be wrong, but I have a sneaky feeling that it would really affect your ability to become as great as you normally could become in music. Do you think that's true? Yeah, and people uh, who are into that reading method, and, and they definitely, it's just like you said, they definitely um, They're missing something. go astray. They, they take it to extremes, and yeah, definitely it doesn't work. Right, I know when it comes to Hasidic music, uh, which is something that I grew up with, and then you hear a musician who never saw it before, but he's reading the notes, something is missing. But he understands music better than I do, the musician. He's trained to read notes and to really know music. But that's, I, I feel something is missing because he never heard that music or she never heard that music in actual life. There's something to be said about transmitting ideas, not just through text, Text is the foundation. Text is what the anchor. But in addition, you need to have oral tr transmission. So why do they take the oral Torah and put it in writing? Now we have the Mishnah, we have the Talmud, we have thousands upon thousands of books. And my small little uh, computer, what is it called? The uh, hard drive. I have now 109,000 books of one library and another 40,000 of another library. All I could put it in my pocket. So we have all these tremendous amount of books, but yet if it was supposed to be oral, why is it all written? That's the question. So the, we, ha we have to learn a little history over here. When the Jews lived in Israel, there was a central authority, the Sanhedrin, the Jewish Supreme Court, consisted of the 71 greatest minds. They had thousands of disciples, constant learning, exchanging of teachings. And they also had notes. Uh, and that's something I should have mentioned before, earlier in the, in, the, in the class. But even though oral Torah was oral, didn't mean that they didn't have anything written. Teachers had notes that they would use to prepare their lectures. But they wouldn't share the notes with the students. They wanted the students to hear the lecture and then, obviously, if a student became a teacher, the student would then take notes and use it. But these notes were called hidden scrolls. They would conceal the scrolls so to, not to force the oral law to become a written tradition. But then, it did become a written tradition. And the reason for it is, as I started to say, that in Israel, there was a central authority. There was tremendous amount of traffic between Israel and Babylonia. And... They were, they were sharing knowledge and they were teaching thousands of people, were teaching thousands of people. But what happened when the Romans took over? First they destroyed the temple, and then they destroyed Betar with the revolt of Bar Kokhba. And then they clamped down on Jewish practice, you know, the ten martyrs that we recite on Yom Kippur. Rabbi Akiva was put to comb to death with iron combs. Others were burnt alive. They were tortured to death because they were teaching Torah publicly. The Romans were clamping down. And then, at the end of the second century, the Romans became a little bit less restrictive and less oppressive. There was a great rabbi whose name was Rabbi Yehuda Hanasi, Rabbi Yehuda the Prince. He was the leading rabbi of his time. He was a great, 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 great descendant 
step son of Hillel, the famous sage Hillel, who lived a hundred years before the destruction of the temple. Now we're talking about second century, and he was the most brilliant rabbi of his time, and he was also very wealthy, and he also befriended the emperor of Rome, who, when he visited Israel, secretly visited this rabbi, and Rabbi Yehud Hanasi realized that this is a one-time respite. The Romans are not clamping down, they're not destroying us, they're, not, they're allowing us to study Torah and to teach Torah. It's not going to last forever. Any of you who remain remember the Roman Empire, uh, if you have been there, you know how the Romans, to them, if you were loyal to them, they let you live. If you were not loyal to them, they would be ruthless. So Rabbi Yehud Hanasi gathered all of his colleagues and thousands of students and they put all of the oral teachings, I, I shouldn't say all of them, they put many of the oral teachings into a text called the Mishnah. And the reason he did that is because he knew that once the Jews start to scatter all over the world, which is what happens not too much after he did this, Jews started moving westward with the Romans to, to uh, France, to Spain, to North Africa, even to England. No one moved to Buffalo then, but we, we still we went far away, and Jews are now scattered all over. You didn't have academies of great scholars teaching Jews Torah. He said, if, if we don't put it into writing, it's going to be lost. You can't rely on the oral tradition. And even though there was a reason why it was supposed to be oral, he felt that it now has to be put into writing. But he made sure that you can't rely on the text, even the new text, without a teacher. You have to have a teacher, because he wrote the text in a way that was sometimes ambiguous, sometimes it was cryptic, sometimes it was missing certain key words, so that anyone who studies the Mishnah, while that will help him retain certain memories of the laws, will always feel the necessity to find a teacher. And that will cement the connection between one generation and another. And to this day, there are very few people who study Torah. When I say Torah, I'm using the Torah in the broad sense, Talmud, without a teacher. There are brilliant people who could study on their own. If they know the language, then you could study Talmud without a teacher. But the system has so built in this necessity to connect to an earlier generation that it guarantees that the oral tradition's benefits will still be around and not be lost, even though we put so much of the oral law into writing. If it, the oral tradition had not been around for centuries initially, who knows if we would have been able to preserve Judaism today so we have the benefit of having it in writing, but also the benefit of it still being oral. Okay, we'll have to stop over here. Can you continue here next week? Yeah, we have one more week. No, I'm, I'm saying, because sometimes you, you yeah. do not stop, and then you, the next week you start a, a new section and things are left off. No, I, I, I picked up where we left off last week. Oh, okay. I, I hope to do the same. Uh, the next topic will be the uniqueness of Jewish law. What are the differences between Jewish law and secular law? Oh, okay. And uh, any questions? The Zoom.